Greetings and welcome there, academic proletariat, to this short fireside chat with Mr. Olson, where we will be talking about anti-communist movements in America during the time periods 1917 and 1929 and 1939 and 1959. Now, to begin this video, we're going to start off by talking about what is communism, and if you know me, you'll know that I feel incredibly bad for having reduced this question to mere seconds, but I'm going to do my best. Anyways, I would define it as a political economic theory put, far, put forth most notably by Karl Marx during the Industrial Revolution of the mid-1800s that called for an abolition of private property, abolition of social classes, and a government to initiate these things, but then eventually di disappear. Okay, It's accentuated by the Russian Revolution in 1917, in which we actually see a state embody these pr principles, or at least try to. Now, an even important, more important question to America is this. Why is it so scary? Well, it challenges individualism, which was espoused from the very beginning of America with the Puritans and their whole city on a hill, hill deal, which you'll remember wasn't all that individualistic. It challenges the, communist, or the capitalist status quo. It challenges corporations. It de-emphasizes religion. But ultimately, it challenges capitalism. And people in America, while they're not, might not be directly uh, tied to capitalism in one way, shape, or form, capitalism is what what drives their everyday lives, and they don't like that being upset. America is a tra traditionally conservative country in ma many ways. We like our capitalism. So when communism comes along and tries to dethrone it, that that's bad. Okay, so let's talk about the first time period, 1970 to 1929. Uh, this is uh, the anti-communism in this era is largely in response to World War One. During World War One, we saw the government take control of industries, most notably with the War Industries Board, and we also saw workers increase their rights and their demands. Now, now, workers and unions, this is important for you to understand, will always be tied to radical movements, okay? There were a lot of German radicals that were um, ridiculed during World War I because Germany was the enemy, in addition to the Russian Revolution, where uh, Russians adopted the principles of Karl Marx uh, to set forth their new post-Czarist gov government. These things um, associated with the war scared Americans. So after the war is over, this devilish looking man right here, A. Mitchell Palmer, is going to institute a number of raids against radicals in 1919. Now, he, he was coerced into doing this by uh, a couple of bombs that went off in his apartment, but he had been vilifying uh, radicals for a while and unconstitutionally going after them, raiding their houses, throwing them in jail, trying to shut them up. And so uh, he raids several of these groups, anybody who's associated with anarchists or so socialist movements, and as a result, they come back after him and try and bomb him. Now, both sides are definitely at fault here. However, um, he certainly overstepped his constitutional bounds in this instance. Thousands of people were jailed for no reason, other than they were suspected to be associated with radical move movements, okay? In addition to that, we have an anti-immigrant hysteria that is highlighted by the Emergency Quota and Nat National Origins Acts, which set quotas on the number of immigrants allowed into the country. This had been a long time coming. If you remember, the Chinese had been excluded in 1881, but this was largely a result of the Gilded Age influx of immigration that nativists wanted to curb. We also saw the Sacco and Vanzetti trial on which two young Italian immigrants were put on trial and with insufficient evidence were executed due to a suspected murder that they carried out. And we also see racial unrest, uh, best embodied by the Chicago race riot of 1919, Chicago Pride. There we go. That's what happens. Anyways, if you don't know that story, might I suggest you watching America, the story of us? Can't believe I just said that, but they have a nice little short bit on that. We also see late labor unrest, best embodied by the Great Steel Strike in 1919. Notice all of these things are happening the year after World War One. World War One did not end well for America. Anyways, whenever a large group of a uh, large number of workers go on strike at the same time, usually because they're in a union, this makes the establishment not like workers and associate them with bad things. Hence the anti-communism. Anyways, anti-communism is largely going to be curbed by the 1920s when a conservative laissez-faire ideals rule the day. Okay, so we're going to depart from this time period and go on to the second time period, that of 1939 to 1959. This is probably the more well-known of the two anti-communist movements. This was largely a response to the great 
Depression and New Deal, but also lar largely in response to the Cold War, which helped create a homogenous political and, so so and social culture. If one were to challenge the government during these time period, they would be branded as a communist. And if they were branded as a con communist, they were sympathizers with the Soviet Union, which was, of course, trying to kill us. And so this focus on the Soviet Union as an enemy really creates for a nice anti-communist environment. But this is one of the reasons why we have consensus in the 1950s is because if you spoke out against it, you were a communist, you were evil. Now, what does this lead us to? Well, the most notable event in the 1950s is going to be the uh, McCarthyism, or what becomes known as uh, the major part of the Second Red Scare. Senator Joseph McCarthy from Wisconsin, all horrible things begin in Wisconsin, asserts that communists have infiltrated the State Department. He says he's got a list of communists in the State Department, which he says he's got 206 people in it, and then the next day it is cut by three quarters to something like 54. Anyways, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But he goes on with this for two years, scaring a bunch of people, saying that the Soviets have infiltrated our government. And what's driving all of this is, of course, the fear of being bombed. And so if there are communists in the State Department, the Soviets can blow us up. The government gets in on the act by creating the House Un-American Activities Committee, which most notably investigates Hollywood, but it did several other things. For example, it's, you know, put out lists about how to identify if your teacher's a communist and it forced people to take loyalty oaths when getting government jobs and so on and so on. But um, as you can see, the girl over here in the picture, she has it right. In addition to these, the FBI got in on the action, J. Edgar Hoover, who surprisingly was an understudy of A. Mitchell Palmer, um, he is the head of the FBI, and he is involved in wiretaps and spying, most notably on civil rights leaders, including one Martin Luther King Jr. Hmm. Now, like I said, I said before, the specter of the atomic bomb is making this all worse, so it leads to a paranoia of spies. There were spies, don't get me wrong. Alger Hiss, Klaus Fuchs, the Rosenbergs definitely were credited and convicted of selling secrets to the Soviet Union, um, but the Soviets would have gotten their own bomb anyways. They, they're not dum-dums, uh, and, and so to really associate spies with getting blown up is a little bit extreme. In addition to that, there's also the fear of la labor organizations best embodied by the Taft-Hartley Act, which limits the ability of people to organize and drastically limits the influence of leaders in un unions. For example, they weren't allowed to be communists, which, you know, goes against that whole freedom thing. Yeah, anyways, um, we also see fear of radicals and social discontents like black Americans, gay Americans, um, anybody who deviates from the status quo, there's a fear that they would be brandished as a communist. Okay, so let's try and bring this all together. Let's talk about similarities first. We see similarities. The biggest one is that they're both, both these anti-communist periods are spawned by fear of the Soviet Union. So the first one is when they first turn to communism. The second one is, of course, when they're more established un under evil Uncle Joe. They're both in the wake of major world conflicts, World War I and World War II, which world wars usually serve to bring the country together. Uh, and in the wake of wars, we see this unifying force throughout American society. And so if anybody deviated from that, it was easily, easy to call them a communist. We also see the overzealous persecution by government officials, Palmer in the first one, McCarthy in the second one. There are some differences between them, but there are two nuances to talk about here. So if you uh, want to dive deep, deeper into it, you definitely can. There's also nativism and anti-immigrant hysteria, which provides a perfect synthesis point for any essay that you can bring this back to the 1840s and 50s when nativist groups like uh, the Know Nothing Party were established. We also see the fear of late labor organizations, which is something that is not going to stop. Ronald Reagan is going to evoke all of the same rhetoric in the 1980s and saying that labor unions are bad and all of that stuff. Both of these also involve periods of economic affluence. The so 20s and 50s are usually synthesized in American history, and for good reason. One of those reasons is anti-communism. Let's move over to the differences and figure out uh, what sets these two apart. The first one did not see the threat of a nuclear attack. The first one is, is much more of a theoretical fear, whereas the second one is a material, real fear of being blown up. And people legitimately have that. I'm not trying to downplay the, their fear of, fear of being blown up, 
but it was a little ridiculous. But they did have it. The first one was involved in, a, or the first involved a period of economic depression. Two, in fact, 1919, and then, of course, the Great Depression. The second one didn't really have that. Uh, the anti-communism came during a period of almost universal affluence minus the war period. The second involved the spreading of anti-communism throughout the world. So we see um, not just focusing on anti-communism domestically, but we see it go overseas. So we see them try and stop it in places like Korea and Vietnam and various Latin American countries, and we could go on and on and on. And then five, finally, the second involved uh, more anti-communist penetration into pop popular culture because there was more popular culture to try and influence. For example, we now have TV sets in every American household. Well, if you're rich enough to afford one. Uh, and, you know, you can put it on TV shows. Movies are more pop popular now. Music is now more in the mainstream than it, than it had been. And all of these things, music to a lesser degree, but all of these other things can definitely have anti-communist threads wo woven through them. All right. So what did we learn through all this? Well, there are similarities and differences between the two time periods. But the biggest, most glaring, overarching similarity is this, that the communists are always unfairly targeted. Be good, people. Be good.